Hi, good day, and welcome to the technical track of Oceanology 2020. Uh, this session is part of the imaging and metrology track within the technical sessions. And we're gonna be talking about 3D image reconstruction. We have two chairs in this session. Uh, I'm joined by Walter Jardine, who is the Global Survey and Positioning Authority at BP. Many of us have known him for many, many years. Hi guys, uh, myself, hi folks. I'm Keith Vickery, I'm with Zupt in Houston. Uh, we're all learning as we go through these interesting times. And this morning we're joined by three great papers uh, uh, in, this, in this particular session. So I'll let Walter say hi, uh, and then we're gonna get on with the first paper. Yeah, hi, uh, good day everybody. Um, welcome to the session with, uh, with Keith and myself. Uh, looking forward to it. Um, as Keith said, I, I work at BP as uh, BP Survey and Positioning Authority. So I'm just gonna hand straight back to Keith to introduce the first uh, speaker. So our first paper this morning, I'm sorry to be looking down and up, but you don't want the piece of paper I've got in front of me in front of the camera. So our first paper this morning is from Andrew Speck. He's a principal researcher with Schlumberger. Uh, he's gonna be talking to us about uh, some really interesting technology in enabling, uh, I would call it an AUV, he calls it a UROV, uh, uh, basically uh, the next generation IMR platform Andrew's got quite an interesting uh, uh, academic background and technology background. He's uh, the, currently the principal research scientist in the marine robotics program at Schlumberger Doll Research. Uh, he's been in that position since 2018. He had a PhD from Harvard in low energy physics uh, in 2005, continued working in atomic physics as a junior fellow at the Roland Institute joined Schlumberger in 2010, where he initially worked on novel downhole sensors for wellbore measurements, including in situ measurements of gas composition prior to transitioning to the marine robotics program. Uh, I think you're gonna find this interesting. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew. Great, thank you Keith for the kind introduction and thank you for the organizers for this opportunity to talk about the work we've been doing. Um, I'm going to talk about work we've been doing to develop a new inspection, maintenance, and repair platform for subsea assets, and in particular, this idea of UROV, which is an untethered ROV. And here, we're trying to sort of bridge the gap between AUVs, where it's completely autonomous with not much supervision, and an ROV, where you have full control by a human, but there's lots of issues with the tether and, and costs. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we're developing this a, a technique based on supervised autonomy where the human is always in a loop, but the vehicle actually has some level of autonomy, autonomy to make decisions at, at a low level. And we're trying to keep this, the human in, in control at all times. So right now, inspection, maintenance, and repair is usually done via ROVs um, and where you have a fairly heavy support vessel, a tether for the power and communications, and then you, you send the ROV down and inspect the, these assets. Um, you have a very high data rate with this. With a tether, you have a fiber link. You get more than a gigabit per second and low latency. So it's great for real-time control and real-time understanding of what's going on at that time. The drawback is, is that you have this tether um, and you have to manage that. And, that, and you also have these, a large vehicle large support vessel that increases the cost with lots of personnel on board. Um, and so we're trying to be able to reduce that and eliminate that tether. And the way we're doing that is this idea of the supervised autonomy. Um, and so we're gonna start off with possibly a light support vessel or some level of residency that has the AUV. Um, it dives down to the, to the area you wanna inspect. And then you can have, a, have an autonomous surface vessel and we'll show some work we've done with Xblue with their Drix. As a, as a surface gateway, you could also use the support, the light support vessel. You don't need quite as big of one without this tether. And the way we're replacing the tether is we're going to use high speed ac acoustic links. Um, so we have a downlink that can send commands to the vehicle and along with acoustic positioning. And then we have a high speed uplink, which is novel and has been developed in house, which enables video transmission over these acoustic link. And with that, you can send both sensor, you know, sensor video streams, but also sensor data. And that's what a lot what I will talk about today and how we've been enabling that. And the goal here, you know, the, the issue here is that you still don't get quite the gigabit per second, but we're getting over 100 kilobits per second. And that turns out to be good enough for real time video and really understanding what's going on with the vehicle and, and assuring that you actually are having safe and reliable operations there near these high value assets. 
Um, you do have a bit of latency and that's really what requires you to have autonomy on the vehicle. You can't really joystick the vehicle anymore because there's about 10 seconds of latency in terms both from the acoustics as well as other, other issues with video. Um, and so you can't, you have to be able to control it sort of a higher level and say, go here rather than drive it there. Um, and that's what, where we're spent a lot of time working on is how to enable that. And the goal here is to reduce the operational risk from with AUVs where you have no idea what it's doing. It's a sort of send, send it off and do, do something and hope you get the data you want. This is one where you actually in real time know that you're collecting the data that's needed. Um, we'll reduce the cost of service by reducing the size of the, the support vessel and the number of people required. You can enable remote operations and other things with this technology. And hopefully in the long run, reduce the carbon footprint of these operations by reducing the, the overhead. So to show a little bit what this is gonna look like, this is, a, this is sort of more of a simulation of what would happen, but here are the vehicles approaching the, uh, an asset, in this case, a, a Christmas tree. Um, you can see down in the bottom left the, the UI that the human is seeing, that the operator is seeing at the surface. And here you have both in the upper right, you have a view of the camera, and then you also have this LIDAR image as it's scanning the, scanning the structure you want to inspect. And by having this, you can have in real time really know what it's doing. You can optimize the sensor parameters if there's a problem. And, and you can also say, oh, I see something wrong, and go and inspect that and pause the mission so it doesn't just keep going, but you actually have an ability to say, I, I need to really look at this place closely if there's something out of, you know, out of the ordinary or worrisome. Um, and so by enabling that, you really can have an ROV-like experience, but with the advantages of an AUV. And that's our goal. So moving on a little bit into the platform, this is a high level view of what we've enabled. Um, in the left, we're just showing sort of, we have sensors coming in, the, which is the perception of the vehicle. You have things like you know, the standard sonars, we have multi-beam and side scan. We have a novel time of flight LIDAR that's provided by our partner 3D at depth that gives really high resolution sub-centimeter accuracy. Um, we are developing a method where we can actually make temperature measurements of, of subsea structures in a flyby, method, flyby, flyby um, mode of operation um, based on the LIDAR technology. Again, we have a hydrocarbon detection sensor that looks for dissolved methane in the water, and we have the cameras on the vehicle. That all goes into the, the, into the computers that are on board which, and, be, and used both for the autonomy so you can have robust navigation, you can do leak localization and, and surveys for leaks, and, and we're developing algorithms for pipe tracking and, and this could, can go on. But you also have that same data does, goes into the client workflows and, and is stored using IVA software so that you can put, do the standard post-processing needed to deliver the reports to a, to a client. On the bottom right is just showing a little more of what, what's actually on there in terms of sensors. And we talked about the sonar and the LIDAR and, and those techniques. We also have a number of acoustic um, devices. We have bi-directional acoustic telemetry that's low speed. That's mostly for command and sort of status updates. We have the U a standard USB-L beacon. And then we have our novel high-speed uplink telemetry, which is what enables the video and sensor data transmission to surface. To look at it on a little bit better, clearer perspective in terms of how data flows, you have the you have this sort of the sensors on the left. That data goes in, into our uh, IVA software we've developed in collaboration with them, where it's merged with the navigation data. And that is really important because it means that now all the, the, the algorithms downstream can work with georeference data. They don't have to worry about the fact that you have data coming in that is time reference rather than reference as to where it's actually been taken in space. Um, and so that's really what one of the places we've spent a lot of time is building this middleware that allows us to, to enable advanced outcomes both on the vehicle, so all the robust navigation, the pipe tracking, et cetera, but also the situational awareness and the human in the loop piece where you have sensor QA, QC, you know that the vehicle's doing the, the mission you expect. And that's by sending the same data right up over these high-speed wireless communications. And then there's a path that goes into the data recording and, and the client workflows. Um, and, and we really feel that this ability to stream the georeference data is a key enabler for any of these technologies going forward to be able to get real-time views of what's going on. So this is just showing a little more of the, of the vehicle. We have, it's based on the SOB Sabertooth platform, but we've enabled a, a lot more advanced functionality on top of that. And then on the right, we actually, these field trials, which I'm gonna talk about, were done in conjunction with Xblue's Drix. Um, and you can see on the bottom, the various acoustic transducers, you'll see the gaps, USB-L, but there's also the, the high-speed telemetry link and a sonar nine modem for the low speed. Um, and so this, and we'll talk a lot about how this, how this happened. We did a number of field trials in the south of France um, off of La Ciota. So this is actually gonna show a little bit of some of the results from this. This is video taken during that and back in the last year, basically. Um, this is some just pictures of the saber tooth and our view of. 
get them ready for these trials. So here you can see the Drix, and here's sort of a, a high-level view. And we have an operations vessel on the upper left. We had some client observers from um, third-party companies looking at this. Then you can see the UROB in the middle, and, and the demo and the Drix off to the right. And then we have this demo site where we're using a, a we're going to scan a, a World War II wreck from of a P-38 plane plane that was used sort of as a nice nice target for these scans. And moving forward. So here here the U UROB is diving. So these were taken about 40 meters of water depth. This is showing some of the IVA, the mission interface that we've seen at surface, where you can see in 3D where the vehicle is at all times, but you also have the feed on the right of the video, um, along with some status and health indicators. So this is showing some of the ability, and this is a, a real live live feed of the of the video. And we'll talk a little more about some of the other stuff down the ro road that we were able to do in terms of the, the sensors. So this is talking a little more about our, our ability to have this sort of percept situation awareness at all times. And so on the left, we have an integrated UI that, that has all the parts of this, both the mission planning as well as the mission execution and, and the Q sensor QAC, QC, which really enables a, an efficient workflow throughout a mission. So you have the ability to sort of control the mission, define it before the job, but also update as it goes along and change, change it if you discover something. You have the ability to pull in you know, previous bathymetry as well as the real-time sensor data to show where the vehicle is in 3D along with any obstacles or other targets around it. You have up in the upper right, the vehicle navigation and, and health monitoring. And then on the, on the bottom right, you have the real-time sensor data feed that, that is either the um, videos or the sensor um, that were sent over our high-speed acoustic link. Showing a little bit more what you can do with this, this rather than just showing video, this is actually showing real the real LIDAR data coming in. And this is just a, a screen a video of the, of the sensor GUI running on the vehicle right now. We've now enabled it where you actually send the point clouds rather than just the video. But even just the video allows you to tell what it's doing. In this case, you could see as the vehicle dived that the LIDAR swaths shrunk, just as you'd expect. Um, but it allows you to confirm that everything is working properly. And that's, that's really important with any AUV where you don't have this real-time control um, that you need to still be able to tell what's going on. Um, going into a little more on the sensors, we also did a lot of characterization of our of the LIDAR. Um, this was taken, in this case, we actually went to a pool, pool that's in one of our facilities in Norway um, and put the, put the 3D at depth LIDAR on the vehicle in that pool, along with also having a tripod, tripod mounted LIDAR, and we were able to compare that. And so in this case, we're comparing the, a compressor system that we that was there um, and actually put some dimensional control targets, which you can barely see, which are these um, black and white checkerboards, which are where you can get a very precise measurement of the center of them. And by comparing those, we were able to show that we had three millimeter RMS accuracy, even when the vehicle was hovering. Um, so it's a very stable scan, and it, which also enables a very fast, where you don't have to set down and, and take a scan and then move the, move the LIDAR and take another one. You can actually do it while hovering. Um, the LIDAR also enables some interesting other ideas. In this case, you can actually look for bubbles in the water column. So as an idea to look for gas leaks, for example. Um, and that actually looks like it's a, it is a very feasible option in the conjunction with our hydrocarbon detector that looks for the methane. And so you can verify the, the methane is there with the, the hydrocarbon detector, but the, the looking for bubbles is much more efficient by looking out in space. We also compared these between the, the LIDAR and the multi-beam and some seabed scans. In this case, we just went over the same area of the seabed of the Mediterranean Sea at, a, at about 900 meters. Um, and the difference between them was less than seven, seven, se seven centimeters. So we're really quite accurate. Um, and we have all the lever arms and, and, the, and the, the data acquisition controlled to be able to take very precise scans at, at the sort of centimeter level. Um, that was also done, confirmed by doing multiple dives over this P-38 rack. And in this case, we basically looked at the point clouds we got back and tried to register them and say, okay, where, you know, how would you ad adjust each one to get them to, to line up properly? Because um, that tells you a little bit of the reproducibility. And when we did that, 
we had sort of a an RMS error of 0.8 meters in the horizontal and 0.13 meters in the vertical. And when you actually look at that, we only had at this time not we only had different standard di differential GPS enabled, not um, RTK or or better. And that actually is the GPS error you'd expect. Um, and so with that, we're we're basically we're limited more by our initial position than anything going on in the vehicle and during the actual mission. Um, and it's fairly easy to improve if necessary. Um, although at deep dives, that's probably the, just the USBL position uncertainty is alone is in that range. So it's not clear that you'll get much better than that. So really coming to what this can do, this is showing some of the, move, the LIDAR scans. And in this case, we are actually taking these data in, rather than just hovering and taking a, a two-dimensional azimuth and elevation scan, this was taking line scans and moving and then stitching this all together. Um, and so you get impressive detail in both, in, in, even in the 3D that you can't really get with multi-beam. Um, you can actually see the propellers and, we'll, and in a second we'll show a little more of a 3D view that shows these propellers very clearly. Um, and so you can get 3D structures very clearly with this technique at, at high resolution. And then the bottom right is the, is the video that we are able to take over, over a, a snapshot on the acoustic link. And so even there, it's quite clear at 100 kilobits per second. So as promised, this is the 3D points rotated around. You can clearly see this, these propellers um, and the other various parts of the wreck. Um, and it's really quite impressive what's, what's capable with when you combine sort of an AV with high precision, high position accuracy with a high precision sensor like the LiDAR. So I guess I would like to conclude that we've sort of done a demonstration of this advanced perception on our untethered ROV platform, <laughs> UROV. Um, and it really is, it will enable IMR services that have the reduced operational risk where you actually know what, is, what the AUV is doing at all times and you can trust it. It'll have reduced cost of service by reducing the manpower and the, and the vessel footprint and, and along with reducing the carbon footprint via those same mechanisms. And the field tests have demonstrated that we can't, we are, can support the fully autonomous operation without the tether. And we also are able to do this concurrent operation with autonomous surface and underwater vessels where we link the position, we basically follow the position of the underwater vehicle with the, with the autonomous surface vessel so that you're always within the cone of operation needed for acoustics. And that's very quite reliable. And then we've also enabled this sonar and LIDAR data acquisition um, with onboard, you know, so onboard data streaming and an ability to stream the data up to surface along with acquiring high quality surveys for delivery to the to operators. So thank you again, and I guess I'm open for questions. Cool. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I guess it's up to Walter and me now to ask the questions because we don't have 55 people sat in our audience. Excellent presentation. I really, really enjoyed that. I guess the first question that comes to me that I'm going to hand it over to Walter is inspection, maintenance, and repair. Uh, I see the inspection bit, uh, is the plan to intervene into, say, some sort of torque tool or intervene into some interface on a structure? You showed the Christmas tree and the, in the interface face of the Christmas tree, is this going to interface into a structure and actually turn something? Or is this truly just a an imaging platform, the, the, the long-term target, I guess I'm just interested yeah. in what you think. No, as you, as you put out right now, it is just an inspection platform, but the roadmap is that we'd like to the slowly enable more ability to interact with the structures. Um, you know, a lot okay. of this would demonstrate the technology and, the, and, and uh, demonstrate that we can safely approach structures closely and then, then go into the next phase where you actually start to turn things and, and interact with, with structures. In this fairly small platform with the onboard package you've got, I mean, most of these sensors are fairly current consumptive. What sort of duration, what dive duration do you have at the moment? We have about 14 hours. Okay. There's quite okay. a bit of, there actually is a fair amount of batteries on the saber tooth. Um, cool, cool. Walter? Yeah, um, well, I've got a few questions, probably three, uh, you know, uh, working for an operator, we always like to get our money's worth. So um, we'll, we'll see how we got on with these. I mean, maybe a, a fairly, 
Yeah, well, you would think a simple one to start with. I mean, Andrew, great, great presentation, some fantastic data, uh, um, you know, and imagery, and, and I think definitely the way the industry needs to be moving. So, so great news on that. And we know several, um, you know, companies are, are moving in similar directions. Um, clarity on data formats, you know, we've struggled historically with uh, with a myriad of different datas. And, and one of the ways of getting more efficient um, and, and better with things like AI is, is to standardize on data formats. Um, are, are you working in that area at all, or do you have strong views within Slumbergy of, of how you help to standardise in terms of the, the outputs from these types of um, these types of sensors for for the data and and, and how you model it? Yeah, and, and I think there's sort of a two part question there. You know, for right least, now, we've we've worked a lot with IVA. You know, in terms of the the post processing and the and the workflow delivery, we've worked a lot with IVA, and so we're using their sort of standard data formats. I agree that yes, a, a non-proprietary format in the long run would be much better. Um, yep. You know, there's a lot of advantages to that. You know, and so that yeah, I think there's places there, and we have some in-house ideas on how to you know, in terms of you know, cloud-based platforms for processing and things like that that we're slowly enabling. Um, but yeah, I think that you know, a foundation of open data is a really important part of that. Um, on the second part, I think there's also a part in terms of open data on the vehicle itself, and and we're trying to build data formats that are fairly interpretable and, and would be open to, you know, to sharing how, what the data structure is in real time, just to enable that and enable people to build their own algorithms on top of this, um, which I think is also important because there's, you know, the real time side as well. Um, okay. And then maybe a follow up on that one. I mean, I think we're obviously moving from a, an environment maybe five, 10 years ago where the, the data we, was, we were collecting for our integrity management teams was, was very visual or, or, or very physical, you know, CP stabs, you know, uh, stopping frequently, getting lights under uh, the pipe to see if it's spanning, et cetera, et cetera. We're moving much more to, to almost geophysical techniques. I mean, I see you, you seem to have a capability for side scan and, and sub bottom profiler um, systems on board and then obviously the LIDAR. Uh, so the, the, the data type that we're receiving is now quite different. Do you see that, um, I mean, do we need, is there a mindset change here or even a skill set change required by our integrity management um, engineers in order to, to, to change how we interpret that data or how we how we use it to manage, you know, anomaly detection? Is, is, there, a new, is there a new skill required here, do you think? I think at, at some point, or at least in a, and, and maybe it's more in, in back to the way the data is stored, you know, going from where you get sort of notebooks and logs of, you know, anomalies that are found to ones where it's sort of identified and, and tagged as to this is an, you know, this is an area of concern. We did some work even on just recognizing anomalies in video and, and tagging it automatically using the, you know, the modern AI and, and that style just to reduce, you know, part of it's also to reduce the, the brute work of just looking yeah. at all the data. Um, to be able to give, you know, here's the things you really want to concentrate on rather than look at hours and hours of video that is mostly fine with one anomaly once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Keith, I don't know if you got anything else you, yeah, you, you yeah, want to add I just in want one. to go down the, the rabbit hole of technology here. Your perception suite seems to be disconnected from your navigation suite. And in most current generation autonomous platforms, perception is part of navigation. So are you using any sort of feature detection uh, and, and say monocular or stereo depth data from your imaging sensors into your navigation solution or is it just a conventional DVL-INS uh, DVL USBL type positioning solution at the moment? As of right now, it is, it is the conventional. We have done in-house work on registering points point clouds between, you know, between scans as well as with, you know, pre a priori maps. And I think that is clear where it's going. You know, there's a point where, you know, you know, with a high end and we have a high end fin system on this, you can get very close to the structure. So I don't think you need to really worry about the perception based navigation in terms of the navigating to get into the, you know, into the area where you want to inspect. It's then how do you get in close? And that's the switch between absolute navigation to something that's relative, relative to a structure. And that's where we've worked quite a bit is trying to to start to build the algorithms that tell you, you know, you're you're five meters off from the structure and, and not quite aligned properly for the scan um, to be able to adapt and sort of correct there. And that's that's really how we're looking at it. It's almost a higher level navigation on top of the, the low level fins. Okay, but it, so will you be using imagery to do that or are you sticking with a LIDAR? We think the LIDAR is probably, given the range advantage, you know, the LIDAR in, in well, in the Mediterranean, you, you, it's been demonstrated at 50 meters. 
Um, I don't think in most cases we'll get quite that, but 10 to 20 is very feasible, even in semi-turbid water. Um, and so that there's an advantage there to be able to see out farther. Um, and then you get the position. And so we're okay. really going more and more towards, you know, we'll use, use the camera to add sort of data to the, to the LIDAR, but not, not so much as a primary solution. Okay. Um, the mm -hmm. LIDAR data, just, to, just a quick point. I think actually, uh, David, one of our other speakers has a question. Let me just finish up with another question on the LIDAR data. The, the, the trend in this space is to try and move towards uh, automatic change detection where we actually have the resolution in the point cloud data set, sort of a year on year survey or every other year survey where we can use that data set to do automated change detection. Do you believe you have enough resolution in this LIDAR data to be able to do that? I think, yeah, you know, we, we are in the sub centimeter accuracy and, and depth in, in axial range and, and better than that if, you, if you're willing to hover um, in, the, in the other two dimensions, just because the, the, the scanning part is much more precise actually than the depth resolution. Okay. Okay, David, you had a question. Yeah, so just kind of following up on the, um, the some of the imaging discussion. So what are the options for the passive imaging um, and, and how tightly do you couple that with a LIDAR? Um, in terms of like, we're, we're doing quite a bit of work now on terms of using monocular vision and, and coupling that with LIDAR. You know, one of the issues with LIDAR, you know, point clouds in general is, is surface reconstruction is hard because it's hard to associate the points with the, the surface and the camera provides quite a bit of information to do that. And so that's one of the places we're really looking, looking at to be able to merge that. Um, and there's also just merging the various sources of point cloud data into, into sort of one known map. And that's really the goal down the road is to sort of combine all the sensors is, you know, the, they all have advantages, pros and cons and advantages there. Um, so is, is there a desire to paint um, what, what an RGB color camera sees onto the to the 3D reconstruction. Yeah, and we're and we're actually we're actually working on that. Yeah, because it's one of the things you know the lidar gives you intensity of, of the green light reflection, but doesn't give you color per se. Um, and so there's, and there's some was, definite advantages. That, one last question about that. So is there ever any issue with clarity um, in in the scenes that you're looking at uh, for the? Yeah, vision? you know the water, you know. The, the optical is definitely a problem in terms of being able to see and yeah, there were ways to, you know, we've looked a little bit, and I guess, yeah, even with your polarization work that um, that there are some techniques to use that to look through turbid water, you know, turbid water is, is definitely a problem. Um, you know, not so much in where we've done the field test, the Mediterranean is beautiful in terms of its clarity, but in other locations are definitely not that good. I, I would suggest there's always issues with clarity <laughs> when we actually get to real work sites. Got one final question, then I'm going to hand it over to Walter. So, and I'm sorry to be back down in the weeds, but so at the moment, then you're not taking advantage of things like loop closure or bundle adjustment with, with any features that you're working with in the imagery. And, and I'm assuming the resolution isn't there in the LIDAR to be able to do that. No, it would, it would be doable. It's been a question of how necessary, you know, and where we're at right now, the, the navigation solution is good enough that it isn't really necessary. Um, we've done work on lower lower cost platforms with much lower end I, IMUs that where we've tried to you know and done that level of slam um, to be able to, to, to do loop closure um, and then it's you know it's a question of you know is it adding value um, or is it is it almost creating noise and so there's there's always that sort of two two front way of you know you either improve the sensor or you improve the algorithms around the sen the sensor um, and I think in the end you will we'll end up having to do both to get a really you know accurate solution. Sure, sure. Excellent, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Hugely appreciate it. I'm gonna hand it over to Walter uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. Yeah, we definitely got our money's worth there. Uh, uh, some excellent questions and, and, and good conversation. So thanks for that, everybody. Um, so we're gonna move on to our second presentation now. Um, this is from uh, Stephen Labars, uh, who has a subsea engineering background. Uh, he's actually now the um, chief technology officer for uh, ID Ocean. He's gonna be talking to us about um, ROV 3D georeferenced concrete armor unit seawall inspection. 
Now that's quite a mouthful, but when you see um, the size of the uh, equipment and gear that they've been uh, 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 surveying, you'll, you'll see why it was such a long title. Um, <laughs> so Stephen tells me um, after an academic training in hydrodynamics and naval engineering, um, which he spent between France and Brazil, um, Stephen worked as a project manager uh, in a commercial diving and marine works company in uh, Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean. Um, he then co-founded ID Ocean uh, with Vincent McCain, uh, in around uh, 2017. Um, this is a subsea survey and engineering consultancy company that focuses on coastal infrastructure inspections and modeling with ROV and digital tools. And in fact, that's uh, Stephen, obviously what, uh, what, what he's gonna show us a bit of the work he's been doing, I think actually in the Indian Ocean. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to, to Stephen and uh, we'll hear what he has to say. Um, over to you, Stephen. Okay, uh, good day, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, yeah, after the great world of the offshore and gas, I'm going to get you to the coastal engineering uh, world where, where we work with local solutions, uh, but we have also great ideas. Uh, my apologize for my English. Well, it's not my native language, so I try to do my best. I uh, hope this will be okay. Um, so yeah, the, just to introduce the subject, uh, I'm just going to present you the work we've been doing over the past two years on the project in Union Island, which is called the New Coastal Road, uh, which I'm gonna introduce to you very quickly. So the New Coastal Road is a project from um, Wig and Vinci, which are two uh, French construction companies uh, in Union Island. So for those who don't know this, uh, it's close to Madagascar and uh, South Africa in the Indian Ocean. So the project consists in uh, the construction of a 5.4 kilometer bridge uh, on Pais over the sea. So we are working a lot on this on this phase of the project for ROV surveys of the of the Pais structures. But what will concern us on this presentation is the other part of the project, which is, which is made of a 6.7 kilometer uh, breakwater made of a concrete armor single uh, layer unit, uh, concrete armor unit sorry, on a single layer, and then the road is constructed uh, over this breakwater. And uh, well, just to give you an idea, uh, the breakwater, uh, well, the shell is above 6,000 units per kilometer. And of course it requires a lot of uh, regular subsea monitoring uh, to check the laying uh, in the installation phase. And then of also for uh, extreme events like cyclones that we get not every year, but uh, uh, let's say one every two or three years here. So it's quite rough events. And then well, what we need to control is uh, the, any settlement on the breakwater, uh, the laying conformity as well, for sure. And then some broken, broken units. For example, uh, there is a nose that breaks. Uh, something you need to know about my presentation is that we are in tropical waters. So we get really, really good visibility most of the time. And that's why we can work with optical sensors instead of um, acoustical sensors, okay? So uh, the classical method that were used uh, by Brig and Vinci for the uh, subsea inspection of the, of, the, of the breakwater was to use divers. So what they would usually do is uh, write on the slab before the inspection uh, where, they were start, where, where they were starting and then where they were going and then just follow the path uh, until the water line. But the problem with that is that they had no uh, reference point on the seabed uh, to know where they started. So, they need to find like with the bathymetry uh, uh, something very easy to see in the water and then identify and say, for example, this is P43 aquapod one. And then from then they could follow. Uh, the drawbacks of this methodology is that during the inspection, they had uh, no subsea positioning, of course. Uh, it was really long for the control engineer to check uh, on which, uh, which block he was seeing on the, on the video. And then it was quite time consuming as well for the inspection. They would do around 110 meter of breakwater a day. And then we have a very special HIC risk also in Reunion because uh, we get sharp attacks. This is not very common, but this was something that the client wanted to avoid. So he came to us and then asked us what we asked us, sorry, what we could do with our small ROV, which is a Blue ROV2 from, from Blue Robotics that we normally use for inland and port uh, inspections. Uh, so he came to us and asked us if we could do uh, uh, near shore inspections in open seas or on the breakwater. So this was the first challenge to check if it was possible for us to work on such, say, harsh conditions uh, in some time. 
uh, what we discovered is that up to both four three on the wind scale and uh, HS one meter, and let's say a current uh, lower than one knot, we could uh, work and then uh, do a whole day of work. And then for the positioning, well, I had tried in the past uh, several USB L systems uh, on such configurations, but uh, didn't prove to work very effectively because of the reflections due to the breakwater. And then we're working very shallow waters as well, uh, between zero and, and four meters water depths. So what we did is uh, we tried a short baseline system from a Norwegian company called Waterlink. And then we mounted it on the, on the vessel with a two meter distance between each receiver and uh, varying water depths as well. Uh, uh, and we coupled it with a HK GPS. And then what we got uh, from that is that we had very, very accurate uh, positioning, I would say lower than the meter, uh, on 30 meter at each, at each height of the vessel, which was uh, fair enough uh, for us in order to carry out the inspection. So on the software uh, side, we just developed a small Python interface in order to get all the NMA, NMEA so messages uh, in the viewer. And then uh, we did our own video quality improvement software as well to improve the deliverables. And then all the logs from the ROV were registered for post-processing uh, the 3D position. And then, uh, well, for the viewing in, in real time, uh, well, we got the 2D position on a GIS software included in a PIP, uh, as a PIP in a viewing software, which is called OVREC from Delta ROV. And then for the 3D visualization of the ROV uh, in the laying drawings and in the uh, project bathymetries, we used uh, Fledermos. Actually, we tried it in real time, uh, but we had a lot of troubles with Fledermos to do it in real time. So for now, we did it only in post-processing. And then uh, we got the true heading, uh, sorry, the true uh, direction of the camera as well by combining the pitch of the ROV and then the tilt of the camera in order to always have a line that's pointing, that's pointing at the center of the aquapod uh, we are seeing on the, on the ROV. So I'm just going to show you a small video that shows our results. It's back in 2019. I just get the sound, sorry. So yeah, it's quite old. And then we did some improvements since then. But I'm just going to show you that first. So what we see here is the video inspection. Well, this one's not that good because there was a lot of sun this day, uh, where you can see all the, all the blocks. And then the ROV is represented as a 3D model on the laying shots in 3D. And then this line is always pointing at the uh, center block, which we see on the, on the video. We did some confirmation tests with the client and we were always pointing at the good uh, Acropod. So Acropod is the name of the block that's on, the, on this channel, okay? And then what we could do as well, and it's really interesting for the control engineer, if, some, if he sees something that's wrong, for example, on the bathymetry, then because the uh, path of the ROV and the videos are time tag, with the same time tag, then it could just go back to the video and check what was going on in the real video. And then otherwise, uh, on the other end, it could do uh, the opposite as well. So the result we got here back in 2019 was, uh, well, a good positioning accuracy for what we wanted to do. Uh, we reduced the time inspection as well. We went up to 170 meter a day instead of 110. Well, of course, we reduced and removed the HIC risk of, of shock. And then uh, the control engineer earned a lot of time during the, the control process of the, of the brick water. So our next idea from there was to say, okay, now we have that, how could we get the, directly the Acropod number, the unit number overlaid uh, in, in a augmented reality into the video inspection. So in order to do that, i just skip this one, yeah. Uh, well, we thought we could use uh, photogrammetry uh, in order to uh, recreate a 3D model of the, of, the, of the blocks and then compare it to a reference 3D model uh, on which we know the number of each block from the laying shots. Uh, but well, of course, in order to do that, we needed the 3D model of the whole, uh, of the whole shell first. So we developed uh, in-house and in-house algorithms that we patented since. Uh, and we call it CBIM that enables to do a 3D digital twin of the whole, of the whole uh, uh, shell. And then uh, from this 3D model, then we can get uh, the position. And actually 
well, this was a co-product at that time that we wanted to develop, but we didn't see any commercial use for that. But now it's our main product and, and we did more than three or four kilometer, yeah, four kilometer uh, 3D reconstruction and we created the digital twin of the brick of the brick water on the new coastal project with, with this solution. So I'm just gonna show you a quick video to so that you have an idea of the of the solution. So this is the as you can see, uh, the, the aerial photogrammetry, the LiDAR data, and the multi-beam data of the project. And then what does the algorithm? Uh, it identifies automatically with a 95 to 99% uh, um, uh, yeah, results, uh, automatic uh, detection, all the blocks inside the, the point cloud envelope. So instead of having just the envelope of the, of the point cloud, then we get a 3D model. So this enables us to, of course, check contacts with, between blocks, check contacts with the sub layer as we have the 3D model. Uh, we can do through time analysis to identify any settlements uh, or movements of the blocks, of course. And the accuracy is in the limits of the accuracy of the bathymetry. So it depends, say, between five and, and 10 centimeters. So once we had that, then uh, we took some legacy video from divers actually uh, from a couple of years ago. And then uh, we compared the photogram materials that we, we, sorry, this is not this one, this is one. So we compared yet the photogrammetry we realized from the video. So we extracted all the pictures uh, from the video and then we compared it with the 3D model we had with the CBIM software. And then from that, then we can get uh, the number of each block directly well. On this example, I embedded it directly in the 3D model, but I could have done it in the video as well. I have another a video doing that actually. And then you can easily identify. So this block here is the one with the, with the cross here over just above, you have another one and it's quite accurate actually. Well, we didn't do the 3D model on the right side. That's why you are seeing on the left side here. And uh, now, yeah, we could get on this, uh, with this method, uh, the accurate number of each block directly in the video so that the control engineer didn't have to worry about what Aquapody was seeing on the video anymore. Um, so for now, we only do it in post-processing. We are not able to do it in real time as other companies uh, might do it on other jobs, but we are willing to, to, to arrive there, maybe in 2021. And then the last challenge we had is that in the intertidal area, uh, because we're in green and we don't have a lot of tides, actually 50 centimeters maximum, uh, where we had no data. The multi-beam uh, was absent, the LiDAR data was absent as well. So what we did is that we developed a photogrammetry uh, process as well uh, from, a, from a vessel and, and a stero stereoscopic system. And then we get the photogrammetry of the, of the waterline that way. And since we have the photogrammetry of the waterline, then we can match this, uh, point cloud with the multi-beam point cloud to reference it uh, relative to the multi-beam in the LiDAR. And then from that, we can also recreate the 3D model of all, all our blocks that you would see right now normally. Yeah, here we get, you get to see more clearly the 3D model we recreate from the, from the point cloud. And you get, you get to see on some, on some blocks that we don't need a lot of points actually to, to find the blocks. Uh, the algorithm is quite robust in you know, to identify uh, alone, uh, all the blocks. So I'm just going to go back. Yeah, uh, just now on our further developments, well, this is where we are right now uh, on this project. Uh, the further developments we are working on is to uh, get the ROV position in real time uh, through Ava Mobilar ROV steering software instead of Lenmos, because it's done that way and we are working with uh, Eva teams now to integrate our digital twin of the breakwater inside the software uh, with each block integrated one by one uh, and then visualize the 3D ROV uh, model directly uh, in the in the mobile software. And then the, the second thing we're working on, uh, actually we're developing a USV, so a surface vehicle uh, on which we will include the positioning system and then the HK GPS and the USV system uh, will follow automatically the ROV so that we always have the, 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 the lowest distance between the ROV and the USV. So we, we reduce the, uh, well, we improve the accuracy of the positioning and then we 
don't get to get we don't get any jump in uh, in acoustics uh, that we could get with a vessel that's not following the ROV as it, it can't follow the ROV so close to the breakwater. So actually, it's a work, it's a project we're developing with uh, right now Ifremer, which is a French uh, marine institute, in order to track turtles because uh, it's a marine conservancy project we are running with them. And then once we get good results for turtle tracking uh, with the watchling system, then we'll uh, switch it uh, to a hobby tracking for breakwaters. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention and if you have any questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, uh, very interesting. A, a lot of uh, detail there. Um, thanks for that. I, I'm, I'm still a little bit shocked at the, the number of actual units that you <laughs> that project was installing. It's yeah, so 6,000 per kilometre. Is, is that what you said? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So a, a few questions just to try and kick things off. I mean, I was very interested to see the the um, application of an SBL system. Um, I mean, that's a technique that that you know many parts of the hydrographic industry has, has almost forgotten about. Yeah. We either seem to work that's LBL or USBL, and and, and the, the the element in between a, a short baseline system has been kind of forgotten about. So interesting yeah. for, for you to come up with an application that worked for you. I guess so that meant that the ROV itself must have stayed um, pretty much, or the vessel had to stay pretty much underneath. Above the above the ROV, you had to keep the ROV within the four corners of the vessel, so that you were uh, you, you were you had a, an internal solution for your your SBL system, or or could you excurt slightly beyond and still have a, a suitable geometry? Yeah, we could go slightly beyond. Actually, we did several tests, and it's true that when we were too far from from the from the big water, then we we had too many reflections and it didn't work. But uh, the good setup was to put the vessel around 20 to 30 meter uh, away from the big water. And then from there, then the, the ROV could travel on uh, say 60 meter uh, uh, area around the, around the vessel. So 30 meter on one side and 30 meter on the other side. Okay. It was working very fine. And after that, we, we, we got acoustic jumps. So yep. that's why we want to develop the USV now and then uh, make sure we always are just above. Okay. And, and then just one follow-up. So I, I assume that means both for the surface vessel and also for the, I mean, it's quite a small ROV and, and presumably that's where you were recording your multi-beam from the, the ROV. You must have had quite tight control on the attitude or inclination of both the vessel and the ROV to deal with the correction for, for um, uh, uh, you know, motion of the, both the vessel for the SBL system and for the multi-beam on the ROV. That, that must have been, and time stamping must have been really important. Uh, yeah, actually, we don't we don't have any merge beam on the ROV, so we oh. but we are we only use the optical sensor of the ROV to recreate the photogrammetry of the of the breakwater. The merge beam uh, comes from a previous survey that's done from the vessel, like a classical merge beam survey. Right. Okay. Yeah. But, but that's then, uh, is that after? Sorry, is that after the units are installed or or before? No, that's yeah. after. Yeah. Or before actually, and what, after. Yeah. What the the current organization is is following? Well, they installed the, all the. All the, the all the units and then the survey vessel passes and then and uh, and he does the multi beam survey and then right. after that we do the 3d model with our cbeam algorithm and then once we have the 3d models they just identify the areas where they find anomalies and then we just go with the rv and check uh, with our optical sensor what's happening underwater and then we get the acoustic positioning right Right, Dada, that makes that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, Keith, you you got some questions, maybe? Yeah, yeah, a, a couple of questions. The, the update rate on the SBL system, it must have been you're working in responder mode on the SBL system, so it's a fairly high update rate. Uh, yeah, normally I think it's uh, well, uh, I'm not sure about the, the reply here, but uh, yeah, actually the 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 uh, transporter sends uh, the, the pulse because it's linked through the, the ROV cable. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the update rate, but it's lower than a second for sure. Yeah, I, I forgot, I'm sorry. Yeah, Yeah. no, 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 no. It's just because you're in an SBL mode and you can work in responder mode, you, yeah. and you're such a short acoustic range, you could get a really nice high update rate with that configuration. Just yeah. practically getting those poles over the side of that small vessel uh, you probably learned some lessons about sort of tying them off and making them nice and firm. I mean, how did you physically deal with that? Because you, you presumably have to pick them up when you want to bring the vessel in and when you take the vessel out to move at any speed, it's bad enough putting a multi-beam pole over the side of a vessel, let alone four short baseline poles. 
was that a practical pain or was it easy to do? You mean like to, I, I'm not sure I understood the question, if you just could So with the short so, baseline yeah. system, you've got four transducers hanging yeah. over the side of the vessel. Yeah. Were they just hanging or were they on a, a solid mount? No, you know, actually we developed a, a solid mount for that. And then what we did is uh, the vessel was not moving. The vessel was moved during the inspection so that we didn't have any uh, yeah, any hydrodynamic force on the on the on the post, ah, and then okay. once yeah yeah, and then once we we finished an area, then we switched to another area, and then we just removed the post from the water. Pick them up we, and we got, yeah yeah, but that's why okay, we want to introduce a USV instead as well, so that we won't have to pull yeah. them anymore. Yeah. The, uh, another one back to the ROV, and I think Walter raised a question. I'm just still interested. Heading, uh, the multi beam gets the data, and I guess you're doing a surface fit of a of like a, a shape file or a step file of these concrete devices yep. to the multi-beam data, data, which is your CBIM uh, algorithm. So you're doing a surface fit of a predetermined shape to the multi-beam. You're finding yes. out where the anomaly is, where something's moved. Then you're going in with the ROV. Heading must be quite important for you on the ROV, on a small ROV. What are you doing for heading? Well, we only use the... In, uh, inch or I am from the from the bureau of it too, actually. Uh, oh, sorry, one more time. Yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 sorry. We we use the inch and or I you from the from the ROV. Well, we didn't get so much trouble with the heading actually. Uh, okay. No, because we are what we do is uh, when during the inspection we are always facing uh, the brick water. So uh, yeah, we don't we don't get any trouble with that. And, and so I guess and you're using the, the, the LIDAR to auto detect where you are in the model, as it were. I think it, it, is that how you then know where you are? You can fit yourself into the model by detecting the shape of the of each of the individual units. I think that's. Yeah, to be actually, how it we, if, if I just go back here, what we do is from the from the video, uh, we recreate photogrammetry uh, of the whole area. And then once we have the 3D, since we have the 3D model of the structure, uh, as well that we recreated with CBIM from multi-beam and LIDAR data. Then we just compare the two of them, and then we try to fit uh, the photogrammetry uh, that we recreated uh, from the video onto the 3D model. And then mm -hmm. since we have it, we can just do a reference to the video like that, actually. Okay. Yeah. So you're not uh, navigating uh, in the photogrammetry in real time, you're collecting no. the imagery and then post-processing to show the anomaly. Yeah, correct. Yeah, we, we, we don't know how to do it in real time yet. Well, it's a, it's a, a goal for a sure. A lot of people don't. <laughs> yeah. That, that will tough. be very interesting, yeah. That yeah, would be good, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I don't, I don't know if any of the, sorry, um, Stephen, yeah, I don't know if any of the other presenters have any questions. I mean, if, if not, um, I, I have one more myself. I, I mean, I, I'm struggling a little bit to understand. I think I think what you said was you each individual one of these 6,000 per kilometer units is individually coded, referenced, numbered. Is, is that correct, Stephen? Yeah, actually, if you, if you have a look, uh, just go back here uh, and check here. So this is, for example, uh, the lean yeah. pattern of the of one of the brick water. It's uh, actually four of them on the project, even five. And then uh, each uh, each brick water is divided into section. For example, here P forty three, P forty four, and into each section, each block has a name, as a number. Sorry, one, wow. two, three, four, okay. five, six, seven. So by combining the the section and then the number, we can know exactly uh, on which uh, which block we are seeing on the on the video. And then we know where we are. And then you, you talked about auto detection of the unit number. I mean, I, I, I suspect this is going to be just too too difficult. But I mean, would, would there be an option to? I mean, could you use QR codes on these on these uh, blocks to, to make it easier to auto detect where you are in in the future? I mean, uh, that's an enormous task uh, coding up every single one of these units. But they they look like pretty expensive bits of kit anyway. And, and adding a QR code to them might be might be one way of auto, being able to auto detect them. I, I, you'd, I guess you'd need multiple so that depending, it didn't matter which way they fell, you could always see at least one of the codes. But yeah, that I, would be, I, I, yeah I don't know. Just, yeah, just a thought. For sure. Yeah. yeah, that would be a good idea, and, and that would be. Uh, doable, but uh, yeah, that's something we need to uh, something we need to work on with the conceiver of the blocks. Uh, it's a French company, so it might help. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, but also, yeah, I'm just yeah. Sorry, sorry. Just, just one quick question: Have yeah. you gone back to any areas yet where you've got any sort of significant marine growth? This looks like warm water. 
it looks like marine growth will take off quite quickly here. It will be really interesting to see how your structure modeling to imagery sort of manages when things start to get covered up with marine growth. Yeah, that's true. Actually, we have a, a project uh, uh, that's we, that we're going to do by the end of the year. Uh, it's, uh, it's an old big water installed uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, it's full of marine growth. So uh, we get to try that. But I'm really confident because since we have a, at least one nose of the of the concrete structure that uh, we can see, and that's not full of uh, of marine growth, and we can we can recognize it. So I'm quite confident it will work. But it's something we'll try at the end of the year. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Cool. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, a very really much. interesting uh, presentation. A little bit different, which is great, and some some nice techniques applied. I, I certainly, if I have any flood issues um, in, in in Aberdeen in the future, I think I know who to come to for any <laughs> uh, flood protection options. Um, I'm sure you can get me a couple of those uh, units um, uh, cheap because there's obviously lots of them floating around. Um, excellent. I'm going to hand back to Keith uh, before this gets any any sillier, and uh, let uh, Keith introduce um, our final presenter for the day. I'm over to you, Keith. Yep, thank you very much. I need some door stops in Houston. I think they'll do a good job as a door stop. Yeah. Uh, excellent. That was really interesting. If you could hand the screen back, Stephen, uh, then uh, we'll move on to the third paper. Our third paper is going to be presented by Dr. David Chenault, uh, who is with Polaris Sensor Technologies. He's going to be talking to us about uh, infrared polarization, polarimetry, for day-night oil spill detection. Uh, it's up, we have some interest in polarization cameras. Anybody that's doing some sort of 3D reconstruction in air or subsea is sort of moving towards uh, the use of polarization and imagery because it gives you a lot more, a lot more observations, a lot more information than conventional RGB. Uh, type imagery, so I'm really interested in this presentation. David is currently president of Polaris uh, Sensor Technologies, where he's leading a team of engineers and scientists developing next generation sensors, including a suite of one of a kind polarization imaging sensors. Dr. Chenault and his team support federal government programs, commercial customers for defense, intelligence, safety, and environmental applications. He pursued research and development in a variety of optical systems before finding Polaris in 2003, the great step of life where you walk off of stability into starting a company. I'm only too familiar with it. He has directed uh, and directly developed a variety of optical systems, including the latest systems for oil spill monitoring, detection and response. I'm going to hand it over to yourself, David. Uh, looking forward to a very interesting conversation. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. And um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, polarization. Um, the, the polarization applications you mentioned are certainly applicable for 3D, but um, I'm going to be talking about a slightly different approach here. I'm going to be looking at uh, thermal polarization and, um, and the, two, the three dimensions that we're looking at are really on the surface uh, as well as the detection of the, uh, of the stuff on the surface. So um, the polarization is that, that we're talking about for this thermal camera is in fact the, uh, the same polarization that we take advantage of when we're looking at polarized sunglasses with, um, uh, and, and with visible imagery that, um, that exploits that. Uh, in this particular case, though, the thermal actually relies on thermal emission, um, and the light becomes polarized based on uh, the angle relative to the surface and the material properties. And it's, those, uh, it's really the material properties that we're taking advantage of in this particular application for oil spill detection and monitoring. Um, the polarization is actually a different, it's an additional uh, dimension of the light that you're measuring. And so it does give you something else that you can detect. Um, and one of the key features of that is that the polarization does, doesn't require any kind of thermal contrast. And I'll, uh, I'll kind of uh, beat this point home over and over again that, uh, that the polarization enables you to do detection when, um, when the thermal actually doesn't uh, provide anything like that. Um, and we don't uh, need any kind of ambient lighting, and so it requires really only the thermal emission. We need something that has a temperature, um, and, um, and I'll show some examples of that. Now, it is important, though, that we do collect both the polarization and the thermal imagery at the same time, so we're not giving up the other thing. And again, you'll see many examples of that 
um, through, uh, through this talk. So uh, here's just one, one slide on how we do this. So we actually use a, um, a uh, polar metric or a microbolometer camera uh, that has an extra, po extra polarization filter inserted into it. Um, with it, the polarization filter is actually embedded directly into the uh, into the camera. So um, a lot of times people will ask, "Is this something that I can add to an existing thermal camera?" That answer is no. It has to. It's it's actually tightly integrated. Uh, but what that does enable us to do is it enables us to do uh, the collection of both the thermal and the polarization data at the same time, um, and in a very small package. So uh, it's possible to put this on drones as well. So we've done a fair, um, a fair amount of testing with this and uh, both um, at test facilities and also a little bit of in situ testing uh, in the real world, if you will. Uh, and this kind of, uh, kind of uh, summarizes the kind of testing that we've done. Day-night testing, we've looked at multiple crude oil and actually refined oil, uh, both uh, for gasoline and um, uh, automotive oil, things like that. We've looked at calm water, breaking waves, um, we've looked at, we've, we've done a fairly extensive study on where, uh, where, where we are sensitive to it in terms of thickness. This is uh, very important in terms of, of oil spill response as well as in uh, monitoring uh, some type of facility. Uh, we've looked at uh, pooling oil on sand and rocks, and we've looked at emulsified oil, and we've also looked at the action of dispersants on the oil in that detection process. And so just to demonstrate very clearly that we do detection um, day and night, we um, put together an experiment at the OMSET facility, which is the oil spill uh, uh, testing and, uh, and research and development facility in New Jersey run by um, uh, the Bureau of Safety of, and Environmental Enforcement, BESI. Um, and on the side of the, you can see the pool itself in the top, that's the, the blue that you see in the left-hand side uh, image. Um, but on this, in order to uh, do this uh, thickness testing, we wanted some fairly uniform thickness samples. And the, in the larger bin that you see, it was yellow that you could see in the, um, in the visible image before things went dark. We have two smaller bins. On the left bin, um, let's see if I can show. So the left bin here, um, we had a, a uniform thickness of about five millimeters, which is really quite thick for, um, for any kind of oil spill or any kind of response activity. In the right-hand image, we're looking at a half a millimeter, so 500 microns thick. And um, in the, um, the, the imagery that we're showing, of course, we show the visible imagery over here on the left. Uh, it's nighttime, so there's no ambient illumination and it's dark. This is the thermal image that you would see, see with a standard thermal camera. And then on the right-hand side is our polarization data product. And in this particular case, um, the, the dark region is the detection. So now in this study, what we did is we, um, of course, looked at this imagery in a, in a time-lapse manner over the course um, of about 18 hours from three uh, in the afternoon to about nine or so in the next morning. We're starting over here again. Um, and so what we did is we, we looked at the contrast of, of the oil in the thick and the thin bin relative to the, uh, to the seawater uh, that, that, is, uh, that surrounds these bins and plotted this contrast as a function of time. The blue shows the polarization contrast and the red shows the thermal contrast. And here, for example, around eight o'clock in the evening, you can see that the thermal contrast between the, um, the oil and the background water is really quite low. The, um, the polarization contrast uh, for both the thick and the thin uh, stayed uh, relatively constant and clearly superior to the thermal throughout, the, throughout pretty much the whole time. Um, you may notice that you're, we're seeing some polarization, uh, dark polarization signature in, uh, in the tank. And it turns out that there's oil, residual oil sheens that are floating around in the tank that are uh, being blown around throughout the evening. And that's, that's what we're seeing uh, in the polarization image. So the point here uh, is twofold. One is that we detect oil at night. And, um, and two is that the polarization uh, 
data product that we're measuring is really quite robust in terms of um, relative to the thermal detection throughout the whole period. So I'll go into the next one. Uh, so just to put a static image here again across the top, you'll see the visible imagery, the thermal imagery now is in this middle row and the polarization is here. So um, there are occasions where the thermal, um, when it, uh, the thermal image uh, shows that the oil can be detected when it's heated by direct sunlight, which you see here as the, um, as the sun rose in the morning. Um, so it is visible, but uh, this is the five millimeter thick, the thin stuff really just isn't very visible at all. Um, so one of the questions that we get a lot of times is, is how, how thick is the oil that you detect? So, um, so we did a couple of, a uh, couple of different experiments. Uh, it, this again is the OMSET facility, the big pool. In this particular case, we had an array of containers uh, floating in the pool where um, the, we, we, put in relatively uniform thick um, oil samples in this array, ranging from about 125 microns uh, all the way up to about five millimeters. So um, again, with, with uh, no oil in the middle to serve as a control. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the, the uh, oil that is, is, is relatively thin here is, um, is almost transparent. Uh, and the, uh, the thickness is ramped up to the five millimeter uh, stretch here. Um, and we did, again, an overnight test of this. Uh, we did a time-lapse test, test of this. Um, and we, um, we were able to see all of these thicknesses uh, throughout the whole time period. So what we didn't learn was what the limit of our resolution is. So we uh, went from uh, 125 microns thick down to um, a, a bin uh, that contained 10 microns. Now, um, it turns out that it's actually quite difficult to get uniform thicknesses in, um, in the larger pool. And so we um, uh, reduced our test set down to much smaller bins in order to get uniform thicknesses. Um, and so we, um, we uh, started out with uh, somewhere between 10 and about a millimeter, 10 microns and about a millimeter thick uh, in, these, uh, in these four data sets. And then we ramped up, uh, we ramped up the thickness um, in uh, steps in order to try to determine what our resolution is as well. And so the, re the result is shown here. Now this is just a little bit of a scatter plot, but we started out with zero and again, added uh, 10 microns all the way up to 100, 120 um, uh, or one millimeter. And then ramp that all the way up to um, uh, over five millimeters thick. And so you can see our thickness response here. Um, we have a, a, um, have a kind of have a peak in our, in our response here that ranges somewhere between about 50 and, and uh, 500 uh, microns or so thick. And then there's a fall off uh, that uh, kind of asymptotically approaches um, uh, somewhere around uh, uh, one millimeter. We can see that, that we get the same response. So another question that we get a lot of times is, can we determine thickness? And the answer is no, not really. Um, we do get this enhanced response for the, the relatively thin oil between about 10 and 500 microns. Uh, but beyond that, we really don't see that. And this does depend a little bit on the angle that we're looking at. Um, and so we, we really can't determine thickness, but we certainly clearly have a resolution um, in this, I call it really 50 microns is, is kind of what I quote as our, our standard um, threshold of detection. Um, and this is important because this is a, about, the, um, about the transition from rainbow to metallic thickness, which is incidentally about where uh, recoverable oil is. If it's any thinner, you really don't want to recover it. Um, and so, uh, to show a few examples of, uh, of, of both um, dispersant and wave detection, uh, we did some, uh, some tests where we threw oil into the OMSET tank in the presence of waves and looked at it over a period of time. And so you can see that um, uh, the, thermal, the thermal detection that we see here, um, we, we actually see this very thin uh, response here and the very thickness, uh, very, very, th uh, cool part of the thermal image. 
Um, and this is what we call our e-therm image. So basically what we do is we take that threshold of detection and we paint anything uh, thicker than that uh, red. And so we can see that we do in fact have this um, kind of uh, very thin detection that is enhanced around, uh, around the edges. But we very clearly detect the oil that in, in many cases, actually in this case here, um, becomes difficult to detect in, um, in the thermal image. So in this case, this didn't have any dispersant image. We did a time series where we actually had uh, uh, introduced oil to the tank that actually had dispersant already mixed into it. And uh, show, this shows the same time series uh, and shows basically that the oil leaves the surface and the dispersant is very effective in this particular case. So um, it shows the, that we can actually monitor uh, dispersant as it's applied to it. And this just shows the, uh, the, the contrast and the detectability of that um, uh, over the course of time. And the, the, the modulations that you see here are in fact um, the, the variation of our detection over waves. Um, we also looked at emulsified oil in the OMSET tank um, and um, by uh, weathering the oil and agitating it with a wave action um, that's, uh, that we have access to with the OMSET tank, we're able to produce a very realistic uh, emulsified oil that is very typical in an oil spill response um, that ultimately ends up looking basically like chocolate pudding that you see here. Uh, and so we looked at that over the, um, in, the, in the same kind of um, context with, uh, with a visual thermal or polarization data product in this e-therm. And so you can see that uh, while it is uh, very apparent in, in the OMSET pool with, uh, with a very clear background, the thermal imaging is just, um, is, is just um, undetectable really with, with the thermal. Um, but that's in, uh, that's in, in um, kind of a controlled environment. Um, this is actually imagery that we took using the camera from a helicopter platform of the uh, Taylor seep, the Taylor oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And again, you can see um, visually, if you know where to look, you can actually see a little bit of sheen. But what we're doing here is we're actually highlighting the oil that is, um, again, above this detection threshold and really represents the recoverable oil that you would recover in an oil spill situation. So we have taken um, this uh, capability and um, because we have shown that it is uh, pretty robust in terms of the detection in all of these conditions, the day night, the, the, the wave action, um, the emulsified oil, um, we've put together uh, what we call pods, which is an autonomous detection system um, that exploits the, the polarization capability. Um, and it, um, some of the features that, uh, that it enables is, is the fact we can do uh, autonomous uh, observation and alarming. Um, and perhaps the closest connection that we have to the 3D um, aspect of the session is that we actually do have the potential to measure the area and report minimum volumes that are spilled, um, assuming that we have a little bit of a priori information, such as uh, the height above the surface and, and the look angle and that kind of thing. Uh, but with the autonomy, we are able to uh, basically do emails or texts or uh, flashing lights or some other type of automated response that you might want to do um, either uh, in, a, in, a, in a rig offshore or perhaps in a, in a processing facility onshore. And we are able to support multiple cameras and do multiple detection zones. Uh, so this is an example of, uh, of, a, uh, of the uh, autonomous detection. Um, this was actually done at night. And so we had ambient illumination um, it, that we turned off there just a moment ago. And what we're doing is we're introducing a couple of ounces of oil into, um, into this, uh, again, a, a detection bin. We have a handful of false, potential false alarms um, there. You can see the, um, as the oil enters the bin, uh, the, the detection happens automatically. And um, in this particular case, we are talking about um, you know, a, a specific uh, camera location and um, the 
the emails and the texts uh, uh, are automatically sent out at the same time that the that our frame here uh, shows uh, detected oil. Um, so moving on. Um, so the applications, uh, both for the for the the camera and uh, and the autonomous detection uh, would include refineries, processing sites, transfer stations. Um, we have um, shown that we can do, uh, we can detect oil on land as long as it's pooling. If it's just soaking uh, uh, soil or vegetation, uh, the detection isn't quite as robust, but if it pools, it certainly is. Um, for oil spill response, there's uh, initial detection and then of course overnight tracking and monitoring. Um, we're uh, actually uh, responding to um, a spill up in Delaware right now for shoreline monitoring and then for uh, dispersant effectiveness, as I showed, um, in, a, in an oil spill response activity, we can, we can help minimize the amount of dispersant that's applied. And so um, I'll, uh, I think I've talked about all this, so I'll, I'll just uh, uh, conclude and open it up for questions. David, thank you very much indeed, uh, an education. Um, I guess my first question, can you walk us through the construction of the e-therm methodology? So it's e-therm, but it looks to me like there's some photoization information going into you painting red as well as the thermal information, yeah? Yes, that, that is exactly correct. In fact, um, Thank you for asking that. So this might be a good example to show. So um, the uh, the so the camera does measure both polarization and thermal at the same time. The the uh, introduction of the filter doesn't eliminate the ability of the camera to measure thermal. So so but it really just depends on how we process the data. The filter is is placed on there on a pixel by pixel data, pixel by pixel basis. So we can um, manipulate uh, neighboring pixels in different ways. And so um, in, in, in one uh, data reduction approach, we actually uh, extract the thermal imagery. In the other data reduction approach, we, we provide this or, or we produce this polarization image. And so what we're doing with this e-therm, um, which is, is an enhanced thermal um, uh, data product, um, we do, in fact, um, use the thermal image as a background because there is frequently um, interesting and useful information in the thermal image. Um, but in when we do have a polarization signature, again, um, the simplest way to think about it is just a simple threshold. If our threshold polarization signature um, uh, gets above the threshold, then we turn that pixel red and replace the, the, the pixel in the thermal image with just a red pixel. And so that provides uh, the, an indication of the presence of oil in that case. In, in polarization cameras, you, you, you've got multi-angle data. In your instance, when you refer to polarization, you're combining all of those multi-angles into a final solution. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. So, um, so you can indeed uh, get... Uh, uh, angle information out of a polarization camera. In this particular case, um, our our angles are, are usually pretty well set. They're pretty much horizontal um, in terms of uh, the surface of the ocean. Um, now, what this what the camera does allow you to do, or what uh, what the angle information that we do get out of it, um, it, the camera is quite small. So it's smaller than your fist, and and we we regularly mount it on um, small rotary wing drones or UAS. And, and so if, if the, if the uh, UAS pitches or rolls as part of its flight, um, then the, uh, the polarization information changes slightly. But again, everything that we're concerned about in the oil spill detection application, everything's horizontal. And so the, uh, the angle information, we just basically eliminate the roll and the pitch of the drone or the of the camera orientation in whatever platform it's in. So, 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 so David, uh, sorry, you're, you're saying that you, you essentially assume that the 
the sea surface is horizontal and you can rectify automatically on that basis and that's good enough. Uh, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Does, uh, that, um, does, does that not impact your altitude of flying though? So if we're looking offshore, we've got a limit on the altitude we could fly uh, to actually get the horizontal data into the camera. No, um, uh, really, our, um, it, we're not limited by, by altitude. Of course, the higher you go with a, with a given lens, the larger the oil slick will need to be in order for you to be able to detect it. You're still limited by optics. But, um, but no, the, the, um, the, the polarization nature doesn't change with altitude. Okay, I, I think Andrew had a question. I'm going to hand it over to Andrew in a second. He had a question. Yeah, I just was wondering how, you know, what's the frame rate like this, you know, especially on these moving platforms, do you, is there a stability requirement to, to be able to process this or how does Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, good question. So the, um, we, we actually have two versions. One is a 30 hertz version and one is a seven and a half, seven and a half hertz or frame rate version. Um, typically on drones, the 30 hertz version, the faster version is what we, what we use. Um, but the, the data is collected in a single frame. And so the, the stability of the platform really isn't that big of an issue. Um, the uh, the seven, and a half first, seven and a half hertz version, uh, we use that when, um, when you're at a fixed site and uh, things aren't changing very rapidly. It also makes it easier to export um, as, as it turns out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, stability of the platform really hasn't been an issue for us. In the size of pixel by pixel, in the bit depth of the pixels here, just so we've got some idea of one frame's worth of uh, storage size or image size for export. Sure. Um, so uh, the it, it's based on the thermal cameras, and they're they're um, the the currently available cameras have 640 by 512 pixels, and uh, through this. Uh, data reproduction, we, we can we can reproduce the entire frame, even though the pixels um, are kind of a checkerboard pattern. We can reproduce that uh, entire frame for both the thermal and the polarization. Uh, because it's relatively low resolution compared to, you know, multi-megapixel uh, visible cameras you can get these days, um, the, the processing is done in real time. So if we mount this on a drone, the uh, payload operator or the pilot actually gets any of these data products um, in real time, uh, so he he can view the scene in real time on the on the ground. Um, we can also uh, put the processing for a fixed site application. We can put the processing right next to the camera, and um, and in a very small package, and, um, and and provide the autonomous detection capability, and then uh, provide a, a much smaller data package like a, a PDF of a snapshot. Um, to, that you can send over a cell signal or Wi-Fi or something like that. But, but you're still talking tens of kilobits per second instead of megabits per second over a link. Yes, yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay, okay sorry, Walter, I think you had a... Uh, yeah, I'm just interested um, a couple of things, but maybe I'll come to the first one. So I, I might be off beam here a little bit, um, um, David, but you'll help me out if I'm wrong. So, I mean, essentially, you, you've got a, this is this is a, a aerial imagery that's that's obviously off Nadia, it's, it's angled, um, which means in theory, you should be able to ortho rectify that and, and, and use an affine transformation and actually map the oil spill and, and, and pull that data and map it into a GIS and, and show the extent of the of the spill and then monitor it as it, as the slick moves. Is that something you've looked at um, already? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the 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 area uh, calculation that I talked about, um, we we've we've um, matured that. Uh, we're almost ready to to start testing that uh, for fixed sites. When you're on a drone, it's a little more um, it's a little more differ, uh, difficult. Um, yeah. Let me first say though that the, the reason that we look off Nader um, is because of the physics of the polarization. We, yeah. we actually um, we we have we if you look normal at a surface, then there's no asymmetry there that produces the polarization signal. Yeah. So you you need the angle. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yes. Yeah. And so that's the reason we're looking off Nader. Um, and um, and of course uh, that angle. Uh, we can vary that angle from five to about 45 degrees and, and still um, and still get the get good detection. Um, so you need to know that angle, first of all, you need to know what the altitude is. And yep. 
Um, and if you have those two pieces of information and have them reliably, then yes, the uh, the geo the ortho rectification is a, is a straightforward thing. Um, as in the smaller drones, uh, getting those angles accurately is uh, really is just a matter of cost. You you do need a good IMU uh, that uh, that's mounted on your gimbal to give you that information. But it's absolutely doable, and and we're headed down that path. That'll, that'll yeah, help. that's yeah, re really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you can essentially map the slick and, and monitor it uh, real time potentially, and, and and particularly in areas where you might have fixed um, units like in ports and harbors, as you say, or on refineries, mm -hmm. um, you, you could actually, you, you know, um, it would be relatively straightforward because everything is fixed and measurable then to, to a high degree of accuracy. And, and, and you would actually have a, a standard format for how that off nadir image can be rectified and then plotted. Yeah. That's right. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. Interesting. Keith, I, I, the other you. question was actually answered, so I, I'm, I've run out of questions, which is uh, pretty unusual for me. So back to you. <laughs> I think I'm the same, actually, Walter. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to, uh, unless anybody's got any other questions, begin to wrap this session up. Uh, I've uh, learned a heck of a lot today, uh, but that's not difficult because I don't know that much. Uh, it's been incredibly useful for me. I hope the audience find this session uh, as useful. I'm going to hand it over to Walter for a minute uh, to let him wind up, and then I think we're going to be done. Yeah, I and mean, not a lot else to add. I do, I do want to thank the presenters. Some excellent presentations, and, and particularly in a, in a slightly uh, different environment. It's never easy doing this remotely, so many thanks for, for engaging uh, fully on it. Um, great. So really just to, to confirm that this is us wrapping up the um, uh, 3D image reconstruction session of the imaging and metrology track of Oceanology 2020. Um, thanks very much, folks.